my wonderful class is here in um, So I'm here to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Quincy Almeida. He's a professor in physiology and the director of the Sun Life Financial Group for Disorders Research and Rehabilitation Center at Wilfred Roy University. That's in Canada. So he has published over 70 peer reviewed publications, 200 conference papers, 20 international keynotes, and has been featured in Canada's top national newspapers and for television stations, and was featured in what several magazines, including MacLeans, which I assume is an important Canadian magazine, hopefully. Um, he's funded by multi-million dollar grants from the Canadian Foundation for Innovation, and has won several awards, including the Franklin Henry Young Scientist Award for Motor Control in Canada, Parkinson Society of Canada Young Investigators Award, the Pawani Prize for Physiology and Medicine, which he told me is the World Election uh, Novel Prize in Canada, the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal, and the Early Career Distinguished Holland Award from NASA. So, uh, a lot of stuff. Um, he is a researcher in Parkinson's disease, and he's going to tell us a little bit um, more about that today. So, please join me welcoming Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Casola, for that uh, introduction. Uh, all of those things really mean that uh, I'm uh, a fairly boring person, but uh, hopefully I can try and make your experience and uh, uh, learn a little bit about Parkinson's disease today, uh, something that might be uh, uh, interesting and something that you can add to your education. Um, as you heard, I'm from Canada, and uh, I was going to crack a joke about uh, the, the Texas Rangers, I hear they're number one in the National League of Baseball, not bad. American League. Uh, the Toronto Blue Jays are about, about to see them, I would assume, in the playoffs. Uh, I'm sure you'll think of me when the Blue Jays win. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're here to talk about Parkinson's disease today. Um, I'm going to do my shameless invitation to Canada. We do have warm weather. I'll tell you it's uh, 83 degrees. I checked. This is our campus if you'd like to come visit. Uh, fairly nice place. Um, tomorrow's temperature is not 83 degrees. Tomorrow will look like this. <laughs> Just joking. That's what our winter looks like. Gets down to uh, somewhere between 20 and 30 Fahrenheit. Um, and if you find any of this interesting, what we're talking about today, uh, of course, you're welcome to come and join us. We have a master's and a PhD program in kinesiology at our university uh, and some fairly interesting uh, stuff that we do at our research center. So let's talk about Parkinson's disease. Uh, as you probably learned in some of your classes, uh, Parkinson's disease is related to degeneration of these little nuts in the center of the brain. When I teach my undergrad students, I tell them to think of a peach. And if you were to pull off the peach, the, the yellow part that you actually eat, that would be the cortex. Underneath there you have a nut, and if you open that nut inside, you would actually find seeds. These seeds in the brain are called the basal ganglia. And unfortunately, if those seeds start to degenerate, then you end up with a shortage of a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And as a result of that, you end up with motor dysfunction. So we have these cardinal symptoms, tremor, shaking palsy in the hands, rigidity or stiffness. Bradykinesia is a fancy word for slowness of movement. Note the root word kin in there, like kinesiology. Akinesia or absence of voluntary control of movement and freezing. Freezing is something we're actually going to talk about today. And postural instability, which is uh, something that I also research at our center. Um, what I'd like to ask you to do today is, uh, while you've learned these symptoms in your classes, I'm sure, I'd like you to think about what could be some of the secondary issues and possibly the underlying mechanisms of why these symptoms occur in the first place. So as you're going to see in some of the videos that I'll show you, we have to ask questions about whether there could be a weakness or a force production problem, fatigue, pain, inactivity. Does inactivity, because they're not very physically fit anymore, does that cause them to slow down? We have to think about these things and think about whether secondary issues are really the primary issues. 
OK, so this is kind of my overview of how we do things. Uh, movement control is at the center of what we do at our research center. And what we try and ask ourselves is, is there, are there things that could link to these movement control problems? Could there be perceptual deficits? Could there be sensory deficits? Could there be cognitive problems? All of these things are processes that drive movement control. If we could understand these things at a much higher level, then of course we should be able to try and change the rehab and motor learning strategies that we use in these patient populations. So let's start with a video. Very simple idea, and I'll ask you to put your thinking caps on and think about why this patient has such problems walking through doorways. For starters, let me see if I can dim this a little bit. Not the right one. Oh, there we go. So that was the double wide doorway. Here's just now a single doorway. And you'll notice that as this person gets towards the doorway, he seems to be doing OK. But just as he gets to the middle of that doorway, his feet actually get stuck. We call this freezing. He looks like he's having some balance issues, and he can barely turn around. In the third video, you're going to notice that I'm going to add a little panel to the door. You'll see it right here, just a little camouflaged panel. See this? It's only six inches. But look what happens. The freeze behavior happens much earlier. I'd like you to think about why this might be the case. This happens very commonly at elevator doors, when patients are trying to cross the street from one side to the other. We thought this was a fluke, so I asked the same person to do this again. And you'll note that the second time that he does this, if that wall wasn't there, he actually would have fallen. Um, I sort of hate talking by myself up here, so I'm going to try and uh, ask some questions at the same time. I should stop playing with these lights, shouldn't I? OK. Can I ask you? Let's try and make this a little bit more interactive. Why do you think a n more narrow doorway causes people to stop early? Yes? So that he can? Hit the wall, is that what you said? OK, so maybe he thinks he's going to hit those walls. And as, as vision tells him that he's getting closer to the door, maybe he's afraid that he's going to actually hit the wall. So maybe he can't perceive the size of that doorway very well. That's a good thought. Anyone else? Slower processes involved in planning movement. Slower processes in planning movement, a very good idea. So maybe his feet are moving too fast for his body, and maybe his body is saying, OK, slow down. I can't make sense of what's happening in front of me, so you need to slow down. In Canada, we, unfortunately, we have this problem all the time when we're driving. If all of a sudden it starts snowing on us, guess, guess what we do? We hit the brakes on our car, because we can't figure out where we are on the road if we're about to swerve off the road. So maybe that's an important suggestion. Thank you. So these are the types of questions we've been considering ourselves. What might cause this FOG is freezing of gait? It's not fog freezing of gait behavior that occurs in doorways. And three of the issues that we're going to try and talk about today is whether or not it could be a visual perception process that leads to poor planning in the first place. Is there a distance estimation problem that you can't tell where that doorway is and maybe you're coming to it too closely or too quickly that you can't figure out where you are in space? And finally, from more of a cognitive model, we're going to think about whether a door could actually be a distracting stimulus. In other words, could it be attention related? OK, so if we're going to try and figure this out together, the first thing we might want to do is try and think about when else does freezing occur. In some of your kin classes, I'm sure you've heard this term dynamic systems perspective, where you think about what things, if you increase the complexity, it could actually cause more freezing to happen. Uh, we could try a very simple example right now, upper limb freezing. Uh, could I ask everybody to put their fingers up like this for me, please? Great. In together, out together, in together, out together. Fast as you can go. Fast, fast, fast. That's good. You're all healthy. Healthy so far. OK, could we try again? Fingers up again, both to the left, both to the right. Left, right, left, right, left, right, like windshield wipers on a car, nice and fast. OK, you're going to need an appointment with me later. 
OK. So what are you noticing? As you speed up, what happens when you're doing the windshield wiper pattern? Discoordination. It's discoordination. In fact, our patients, one of the limbs actually freezes altogether, and they can only continue one finger. For us, we fall into the in-phase pattern because our brain likes to coordinate the same movement with both hands. So it is an interesting thing. Um, when we ask patients to turn, the sharpness of the turn angle, the more sharp the turn, the more the freezing that occurs. Uh, and there are other high frequency triggers, which I'm going to show you. I shouldn't have played with this thing, because now I don't know how to make it. Uh, let's see if I can. There we go. That's better. OK. So ironically, I like to play with light switches a lot. Sometimes people ask how I get this approved uh, through our ethics process at my university. But what we did, uh, think of that doorway experiment where you saw the video of the person walking towards the doorway. Somehow I got it passed through ethics to ask patients to walk to a doorway in complete darkness. Okay? Um, so here, frame just represents, uh, imagine the exit doorway at the end here. If I shut off all the lights on us here and I said, okay, let's try and walk our way to that doorway and see if you can walk without freezing. If you count the number of freezes, you can see that the number of freezing episodes is up near 50 or 60 trials. If, however, I asked the person to start at the doorway, so that would be starting at the doorway and walking into the center of the room so that there's no walls to potentially crash into, this fits with your suggestion, you can see that the number of freezes actually decreases quite tremendously. And we've played with these conditions uh, a bunch of different ways. We were trying to solve uh, ways of getting rid of the freeze. I had students like yourselves, and they said, well, how about we put glow-in-the-dark tape on their arms and legs? So that's what this uh, frame plus body would mean here. And ironically, if you put uh, um, glow-in-the-dark tape on the body, it actually causes more freezing. So we have to think about why that information about where your limbs are in space as you're moving in darkness increases freezing. Perhaps it's about the sensory information that drives our movements. Uh, but let's try and answer these questions in order. Let's talk about visual perception. What we will do, and I guess I should have told you that we were going to be doing lots of little tests today. So we've done our first one on bimanual coordination. The next one is a test of your visual perceptual processing. All I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a bunch of lines, and I want you to count how many lines you actually see. Okay? Fairly simple test of your visual processing and how fast you can process something. Everybody ready? How many lines did you see? OK, very good. My Canadian students don't do so well with this. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. I'm going to speed up the amount of time that you have to see the figure this time. Ready? How many? Zero. Just joking. I haven't hit the button yet. <laughs> Ready, here we go. Six. Six, very good. Notice that the time was shorter. We're going to do it again. Ready? Six. Now you're more on par with the Canadians. There we go. Uh, that was six as well. What you saw me doing there was I was decreasing the amount of time that you had to visually inspect the environment. OK? As the amount of time gets smaller, of course, you have to process a whole lot quicker. And if you don't, then of course, you end up with lots of errors. If we do this with our Parkinson's patients, and this is the type of task that we would ask them to do to just judge. Imagine seeing this figure on a computer, and you just have to decide, is this side longer or is that side longer? When I ask my Parkinson's patients to do this same type of test as what you just did, they actually require 50 to 60 milliseconds more than you or I would to be able to inspect their visual environment. That means that when they're moving towards a doorway, or if a child is running out in the middle of the street to go and grab their basketball as they're driving, they need an extra 50 to 60 milliseconds to be able to process what's about to happen in front of them. You can see that there could be some consequences for movement if they are not able to process that quickly enough. So perceptual processing is, of course, something important to consider. We could try and take this a step further and say, well, if they need 50 to 60 milliseconds more, could that interact with 
when we are actually moving. So now let's think of the example of uh, driving a car. When the light changes red, I've noticed that here in Texas everybody speeds up when the light changes red. But in Canada, when the light goes yellow, you have some time to judge, am I going to make it through this light or not? With our patients, it's possible that if they need this 50 to 60 milliseconds longer to be able to process where they are in space, maybe their judgment of when to hit the brakes in their car is also off. So we have to ask this question, is there some sort of interaction when they're trying to get towards a target? And we could think about walking out a doorway the same way. I happen to have a laser pointer in my hand so I can explain this uh, experiment fairly easily. Um, imagine, ah, see the water bottle that's on the stage over there? Imagine seeing the water bottle and then I shut off all the lights on you and you could be standing in the position that I'm standing. In this experiment, this laser condition would be, I shut off all the lights, I remove the water bottle and I say, take the laser pointer and point to where you think that bottle is. So I can't do it very well from here, but if the lights were all off, I would be able to guess where I think the water bottle would have been. Understand? Uh, what we have here is three groups. The black bar represents healthy control participants, so people of the same age as my Parkinson's patients. Parkinson's patients off uh, on their Parkinson's medications, Parkinson's patients off their medications. And what you can see is that when they have a laser pointer, they in fact do quite well on this task. They do the same as anyone else of their age. If I draw your attention to the other side, we had them do this very same task, except this time we put them in a wheelchair to play with the sensory information that they have. So if you're in a wheelchair, and it's no longer the laser pointer, you're not using vision to judge where that water bottle is in space. We actually wheel you and we say, tell us when to stop. So I'm pushing the wheelchair along, pushing, 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 and when they think they're at the water bottle, they say stop, and then we measure the error. In this case, you can see that the Parkinson's patients, regardless of the medication that they're on, perform worse than the healthy participants. Healthy participants are a little bit more accurate at doing it but there's no difference between medication states. Here's the puzzling part. If we focus on the center graph, now notice that the Parkinson's patients off their meds are performing much differently than the healthy control participants. All we did differently in this case is we said, look at the water bottle, see where it is, shut off the lights. We asked them to walk there. Can you tell me what sensory systems are helping me walk to get to that target right now? How do I know where that water bottle is? What? I saw it, yes. What else is helping me get there compared to a wheelchair? I've got sensors in my legs, right? What are those sensors called, do you remember? Proprioceptors, very good. So when we have proprioceptors and vision together, you can see that these Parkinson's patients do in fact have some sort of issue, and that issue is related to the dopamine medication that they have in their system. I'm trying to point these things out because we generally think of Parkinson's disease as a motor disorder, but what if, what if the real problem in Parkinson's disease was in fact a sensory issue? Maybe the sensory systems are telling the motor system the wrong thing, and hence we end up with motor problems because we don't have well-functioning sensory systems. Okay, I'm assuming I'm going to get a giggle out of this. Um, this is to try and encourage you to consider research. One of my master's students, a um, female student from Singapore, she was having difficulty trying to create a project, but she knew that we were on this sensory kick. And we wanted to try and figure out if these people who experience freezing of gait, if they have any issues with feeling sensory information. I asked her to walk to uh, an adult store down the street from my research center and I asked her to find the two strongest vibrating devices that she could find. I did. I gave her my credit card. <laughs> she had no idea why I asked her to do it. But um, what we were doing is we were playing with the proprioceptors. We took these vibrating devices. They're pink for some reason. But uh, <laughs> we took these pink vibrating devices. We taped them to the uh, tendons of the knee. 
And we ask people to try and flex and extend their knees, matching a force curve that you could see on a TV screen. And when we turned on the vibrating device, we were expecting that it would fool the sensory systems. If you could feel that vibration and it tricks the proprioceptors, then you wouldn't be able to follow the curve very well. Our healthy people, they managed uh, not so well. So when they got the vibration, they were skewing from the line that we were asking them to follow. Our freezing patients, however, they weren't bothered by the vibration. We actually bought heavy duty batteries and we cranked up the power on these vibrating devices. It was pretty cool. The freezers did not respond. It's almost as if their knees couldn't sense that information. Something important to think about. Okay, so we know that there could be a visual perception problem. We know that there could be an estimation problem, and it might be related to the ability of proprioceptors to give us appropriate sensory feedback during movement. One other thing that we could think about with these doorways is whether or not the doorway could be a distracting stimulus. So one of the ways that we try and look at these types of tasks is uh, not only will we track their walking, and you can see that in these videos, I've got actually a carpet here that measures how they're walking. At the same time, and what you're going to see with these red crosshairs here, is if we track what the eyes are looking at. So if we follow this little point here where the, where the lines intersect, this is supposed to be representative of what your eyes are looking at at the time that you're approaching a doorway. So I'm going to show you two videos. This first video, video is a freezer with no MCI, uh, MCI stands for no mild cognitive impairment. And if I show you this video, this is how most people would look. If you look generally right down the middle of the pathway, if you look a little bit to that plank, that was that uh, plank that I was trying to use to deceive people into thinking that the pathway was more narrow. And for the most part, all healthy people do that same thing. Here, however, is a patient that shows me this freezing behavior, but he does have some sort of cognitive impairment as well. What I'll ask you to notice is how sporadic and how spontaneous his eye movements are. Good steps. Good job. Good job. You can see he's already jumping all over the place. He's already scanning both sides of the door as if there's a threat there. And even when he gets beyond the doorway, look how much his eyes jump around. He seems to be scanning absolutely everything, which means that maybe in some cases there could be a cognitive issue in the sense that we don't choose the right things to scan in our environment to decide how we're going to move through space. Another potential issue to consider in Parkinson's. All right, uh, I'll show you one more example. This is a test question for you. Uh, what we tried to do here is um, see if there's some sort of perceptual processing deficit that might cause these people to freeze more. So we've got two pathways here. One pathway where you can see the walls are narrowing down to this opening at the end. We've got another one where the pathway is narrow all the way through. With a show of hands, can you tell me how many of you think that there would be more freezing occurring right here? Hands up. OK. Maybe about a tenth of you. And how many would vote for this one causing more freezing? Oh, isn't that interesting? OK, well, you are in fact correct. We thought initially that perhaps if we had to process the fact that these walls are getting narrower and narrower and narrower as you were going, if it was a perceptual online processing issue, that you might expect more freezing on this side. But in fact, the freezing really occurs much more on this one. And if we ask the patients, you know what they tell us? They say that they're scared and they're expecting to bump into the walls at some point. So they're heightened in terms of their sense of proprioception. It ends up being quite a concern for them that they end up freezing a fair bit. OK. So with that in mind, the fact that this narrow tunnel, um, they describe it being distracting for them, we were trying to figure out other ways that we might be able to evaluate this distraction idea. So what I'm going to show you now 
is a patient who's walking towards a doorway. So this, this, this video is going to show you him walking towards the doorway. This is the same man uh, as he's approaching the doorway. So these are going to play simultaneously. And at the same time, we're going to give him a dual task. A dual task is basically a string of numbers to try and distract him as he's walking. So it's supposed to make the task more complex. I'll show you what this looks like. So this is a fancy recording carpet that shows you center of pressure, almost like a force plate. And you'll notice right about here, you can see that his feet are starting to get frozen. You can see that his feet are stuck there in both videos as he's just in front of the doorway. And I'm going to start playing the next video already. This is still playing, as you can tell, but it takes quite a long time for him to get out of that freeze. Notice that in the second video, I've got lines for him to step on now, and let's compare the difference of his step length. So this is taking away that attentional distraction and giving him something to focus on. Notice the other video is still plays, playing because he's frozen. Look at the size of the steps here and how easily he's getting to the doorway. He's still frozen on this one. This is still going right now. And in this case, he freezes just at the doorway, but nowhere else. So if you have very focused information, you can actually get rid of this freezing behavior altogether. This third condition is combining those two things together. So imagine hearing a string of numbers that you have to listen to uh, to try and distract you. At the same time, you've got those visual cues. What do you think is going to win? Are the visual cues going to help or the dual task going to harm? Let's see. And we can compare these plots, and you can tell me which one it looks more like. What do you think? Not so much freezing going on, is there? So right at the end there, you can see a little bit of freezing, but that's not really any different than when the visual cues were there, right? So it seems like the visual cues must be doing something to help. Well, we tried something uh, slightly different, and I don't know if you can see this from where you're sitting, but we built a little plate that was projecting out of the guy's chest so that you can't actually see where your feet are in space. And this is to figure out whether this is an attentional issue or is it something sensory. And by sensory, I mean well, if you can't see your feet because your feet are hidden from you by this plate that's covering your feet, is that something different than attention being focused on these lines? And I'll ask you again if this performance looks more like the dual task where there was a lot of freezing or if it looks more like the visual cues. So you still have the visual cues, but surprise, look, he's already frozen. You have to be able to see your feet. If you look at the zigzags here, doesn't this look more like the very first video when we were trying to get the person to pay attention to the string of numbers? So this is sort of information for us that tells us if you have vision, but you don't have proprioception, or I guess the other way around, you still have proprioception, but you don't have vision of your legs, you can see that there's some pretty serious consequences. And this video is still playing, and he's still frozen at that point. But it does give us the hint that maybe this is more a sensory issue than it is a cognitive issue. Uh, this graph basically shows the same thing. Uh, here's baseline performance in terms of what step length would look like. At a narrow doorway, um, healthy step length is usually about 65 centimeters. You can see that if you walk to a narrow doorway, uh, it's generally shorter. If we give visual cues, we can get these freezers to walk closer to the 65 centimeters that you would expect them to per uh, step length. Look what happens with the dual task if you try and distract them. It suffers much, much more severely. If you add both visual cues and dual tasks together, it's essentially like having the visual cues alone. And if we hide vision of the lower limbs, it's almost like you're distracting them. Sort of clear information as to figure out what really is causing this freezing behavior. 
Here's something else fun that we've been doing in our lab in the last little while, only because of challenges, in fact, from some Americans that uh, had seen some of our research. Um, if you think about all these examples, walking across the street, uh, walking in darkness, the one thing that comes up is threat, right? The potential to be anxious. So we have some, uh, it's almost like a video game, uh, virtual reality equipment where you can put goggles on a patient, ask them to start at one point and walk across a plank, but if the plank is on flat ground, then it's not that hard for them to walk. Imagine during your video game, you see the entire floor drop 200 feet beneath you, and then you ask the patient to walk that same plank. Yes, I do get these all passed through ethics somehow. Um, look at the number of freezing episodes on the high plank. Almost 100, even higher than walking in darkness. Um, and the yellow here represents the freezing group, and you'll see that the freezers have a whole lot more variability in both step time and step length, which means that their steps are very, very stuttery, especially at the high planks in both of, the, uh, both of these cases. So anxiety might actually be part of this equation as well. So if we put this all together, we could think about how these pieces fit into our understanding of Parkinson's. Um, there's clearly some cognitive issues because if we ask them to pay attention to a string of numbers, it causes some issues for them. We also know that if we take away vision of their feet, there's some sensory problems. We know that they have uh, some difficulty and they need more time to make visual judgments. There's a depth perception problem. There could be an anxiety problem. And these are all things that could be treated. When we give dopamine, we give dopamine to try and improve the movement system, the motor control system. But rehab, and I imagine some of you are interested in physical therapy or occupational therapy, none of these things do we treat right now for Parkinson's. Can you imagine if we changed how we looked at Parkinson's disease and we tried to correct these problems, the benefit you might have for these patients? So, um, in terms of the basic science of what I wanted to talk about, sometimes I think it's better to ask the question, what is attention diverted from? If we're distracting someone, is it that we're distracting them from the sensory information that they really need to process to be able to make sense of how they move in space? Um, because I know that many of you are interested in uh, physical therapy, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, uh, I just want to tell you about a conference that I was at in um, Washington. Uh, I was very honored as the one Canadian other than Michael J. Fox that was on the stage, but then he turned to me just before he introduced me and he said, and scientists have been too busy in their labs. I did a search on PubMed and there were 15,000 citations about Parkinson's over the last seven years. And then he held on to his tie and he said, I'm not tying my tie any faster. My heart sank. I do all this basic science research on vision and playing with vibrators and things like that. And all he had to say to me is, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference to my life. So we started to look at exercise. And in animals, at least, I can tell you that uh, if you induce Parkinson's disease in a rat, if you force them to run for seven hours a day, and if you put a little electrocutor at the bottom here so that if they fall down the slide and you zap their butt so that they keep running, you can actually get rid of Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, I can't do this with my patients. <laughs> but very quickly, I'll show you this video. I'm just going to jump to the middle of the video if I can. This is the Cleveland Clinic, uh, Jay Alberts. He took uh, patients. Let's see if I can put this down. You can see the patient is on the back of the uh, bicycle. There's a trained athlete on the front of the bicycle. And the patient is being forced to pedal as fast as the person on the front of the bike. It ends up showing quite an improvement in the symptoms of Parkinson's, up to 30%, which is quite impressive. It's not a drug, it's just exercise. 
And the question is, is what is the reason for this improvement? If you think about it, and this is our research center, we can do the same thing on a treadmill. We can force people like the rats to go faster than they want to on a treadmill. I can put them in a harness and I can crank up the speed on the treadmill and make them go faster than they're capable of going. And if you think about it, what are we driving when we do this? Adaptations. What systems, what, what, I almost gave away the answer. What messages are we sending to the brain and what's doing it if we make their legs run faster on a treadmill? Jay Alberts didn't have an explanation for this, but I think we have one now. What sensory information do you get? Proprioceptors. The proprioceptors. If we act to make the proprioceptors send more information back to the brain, could that be the real reason why exercise ends up improving the Parkinson's condition? If we test balance on a balance machine, we can test upper limb function, you end up finding that working on proprioception ends up enhancing the Parkinson's condition. Uh, very quickly, I'll just show you this graph that compares different types of programs for uh, rehabilitation. Strength training, aerobic training, control group that does nothing, and as you can tell, this line is negative, which means that over 12 weeks they actually get worse in terms of their symptoms. Aquatic training, and then something that we call, we created this, uh, Safex, which I found out is a brand of condoms in the States. <laughs> it's not in Canada. Uh, but SAFEX stands for Sensory Attention Focused Exercise. Training our Parkinson's patients to be able to make use of proprioceptive information, pay more attention to it so that they can actually control their balance and their walking and their upper limb function quite well. And notice that this is one of two. Strength training happens to be a significant improvement as well. Uh, these two groups are the only types of rehab that in fact provide you a significant benefit over the control group after 12 weeks. This is something that kinesiologists can do. Uh, this is why I would encourage you to think about things outside the box and not necessarily everything that you get from a textbook because there is hope that we can actually improve some of these conditions. Okay, I'm going to leave you with one last video. I know some of you have to get to a class. Let me show you how simple a sensory trick could be. Here's one of these patients that freeze. You can see the freezing in this case is quite severe. Remember I asked you to think outside the box. How could we get this guy to walk better by enhancing some sort of sensory cue for him? Watch this. Pretty amazing. I should tell you, by the way, he was a soccer player. <laughs> but you can tell this is pretty amazing. Imagine taking away somebody's mobility, but then giving it back by a simple ball on a string. Um, with that, I think I will stop. Uh, here are the funding sources for our research. If you find this stuff interesting, um, I'd love to hear from you. Our email address is mdrc at wlu.ca. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Yes, correct. Ah, that's a good question. So um, the question was, the exercises, they improve the overall motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease the same way that drug does. Does it improve the freezing? Not exactly, no. This is a challenge for us, and this is why our research focuses on the freezing, because one, the dopamine drugs don't improve the freezing. For some reason, exercise doesn't improve the freezing, which means there must be some other mechanism behind it, and that's why we're after trying to figure out this mechanism. Great question. Yes? Why did you try to work with Parkinson's patients? Oh, uh, why did I start to work with Parkinson's patients? Well, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a quick story. What year are you in right now? 
You're a junior. Okay, so in my fourth year of my undergrad, I was at an institution called uh, McMaster University in Canada. And I would have asked one of my professors who was teaching me in kinesiology about Parkinson's disease. And I put up my hand in the class and I said, well, if Parkinson's works like this and the brain is supposed to work like this, shouldn't we be trying this type of exercise strategy? And uh, the professor actually laughed at me and said, if it was that easy, somebody else would have thought of it already. I left that class quite embarrassed. I was in my fourth year, uh, and I thought that I would never amount to anything in academia. Uh, the Dean of Science came to find me after that lecture, asked me what was going on, and asked me if I wanted to do a thesis research project on that very idea. He was published in Experimental Brain Research in three months. I was right. That's what got me started. You talked about the experiment that you did with the wheelchair. Yes. You, you pushed the patients to a point where they said stop. Did you do a condition where they actually pushed themselves? Push themselves in the wheelchair. Uh, so the question was, uh, with the wheelchair, did I ever ask them to push themselves in the wheelchair? Which would be a condition where they're actually using some of their own proprioception of their arms plus the vestibular system to get them to that point? It's a good question. Uh, we hadn't done the condition, but I would assume that the results would show that they'd be halfway in between that wheelchair condition and...